Queen Yard at 87. Made his last trip to the Queen Yard a month before he died. I'm not going to talk about that anymore. I still, he's been gone 10 years. <coughs> I'm still all for Clint when I bring up, you know, talk about him as, as a beekeeper. Uh, ended up uh, doing a PhD and headed off to the West Coast for a different career. And woke up in LA one morning and said to the wife, we don't have to do this. <laughs> we could be living on the farm and our boys could be growing up in the same school I went to. And, and so at age 35, moved back to the farm uh, for a quality of life decision, turned down a university teaching job to do it, uh, which broke our hearts because we planned that and, and blood, sweat, and tears to get the, that, you know, that, those degrees and certifications. And I wouldn't trade, uh, I wouldn't give you anything for those two, the 35 year old, <laughs> to me as a kid, so those young people in here, you know, those two kids, my wife and I, that sat there and turned down that job and said we're going to stay home and do the farm, <clears throat> what a great decision they made that day. And so I'm, I'm proud of them that they had the foresight uh, to do that. They made a lot of other bad decisions along the way, uh, but don't we all? And I love, I love my job. I uh, love what I do, and uh, so I'm going to share with you a little about, oh, I was going to say cred, credentials, why can I talk about varietal honeys? I literally have kept bees uh, working for my dad, my uncle, my grandpa, myself. Uh, Janice and I have owned the business 25 years all over the state of Texas, California, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Colorado. So we, we've been around and we've seen a little bit. Uh, so this is not out of the books. This is out of this book. In fact, even I use some, some, some charts and graphs in here that I borrowed from other people because I've never put some of the stuff on paper that some smart people, and I hope you will do at least one of the things I'm going to recommend here that you will commit it to uh, the paper for yourself if, you're, if, you, if you get involved in this. Okay, so let's see if we can get back to the start of this thing. It looks like it's kind of advancing on its own, doesn't it? And help me, help me, help me, help me. <laughs> me and technology. The, the smart young people that work for me say, you know, you're just barely functional on computers. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I can use the mouse. That's no problem. Let's don't sweat over that. I'll just, if the mouse is working, I'll do that. I'll, do, I'll use an arrow. I know how to do it. Here's a slideshow. Now let's do a slideshow. Yeah, let's do that. And then let's go over to the left and go from the beginning. Say, oh, F5. Somebody knows their stuff here. From the beginning. F5. 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 And it's true F5 there. We're going to there. It's time. We've got to kill the timer. There, you use time. Let's cut that business out. There you go. I was right on that, wasn't I? I just took a guess, but it's okay. All right. So, um, as, I, as I feel obligated to do any time I give a talk is say, I don't have any answers. I'm just telling you what I do. I'm just trying to plant seeds, and I'll answer questions, and it'll be out of my experience. And so it won't be right. It'll just be what I do, and uh, and it won't fit. It won't fit your circumstance. It may or may not, you know. But by seeing what I'm doing in a certain situation, you'll see how I'm responding to plants and biomes and and weather and and conditions and bees. I'm not going to talk much about the bees because you know that's a no, you know none of us knows how to be successful in, in building populations of bees. I grew up in a time. So right now, in my commercial operation, we're running 1,000 hives. We, we, historically, we've been at 2,500. And uh, in the last few years, because of some structural changes in our company, because we're not going to almonds and we're not going to Dakotas, we're running in five counties in Central Texas, we've pared it down to 1,000 because that's what we can keep in wild areas. And we've pulled ourselves out of agriculture and we're using organic acids in the hive and no antibiotics. And so I'm not gonna go into any, any of that, I'm just saying, until the 90s, till the mid 90s, I could manage, I knew how to manage a colony to get to 50,000 uh, uh, worker bees in that colony. Now, if I'm at 35,000, I'm thrilled. Now, the difference in 35,000 workers in a colony and 50,000 workers, T. Lee can tell you, that's not 15,000. That's half the honey crop, okay? Because that next 15,000 are all foragers. 
and you double your honey crop. We used to we used to do everything we could do to get bees out of high shape packages, stock queen nukes, make splits in March, uh, all the way through just to try to get the bees to hold off on swarming till the Wahia or the Yo in South Texas or the Yopon uh, in Central Texas bloom March the 25th. And now warm winters, the Yopon bloom this year March the 10th. Not in my lifetime, not in my dad's lifetime, not in grandpa's lifetime. 1930, we've kept bees on Yopon since 1930, every year. That was our first honey crop. It's never bloomed on March the 10th in 80, 88 crops that we know of. Okay, so everything's, it's all new landscape, and I'm just going to stand up here and tell you, I can't get a 50,000, I can get a few 50,000 colony hives. So I still know they produce twice as much honey because I have them every year. But 1,000 hives or 800 hives out of 1,000, I can't get them there. I don't know how to do that anymore. Okay. So, thank you, yes. Okay, you were just, man, I tell you, I love, I love help. Okay, well, so my formatting wasn't good there, but beekeepers are bloom chasers. And uh, so this right here is, uh, and I bet you that works, there you go, all right. Uh, that's dad about uh, 1942 when he was uh, 22, 25 years old, somewhere along in there in the early 40s in the Rio Grande Valley. That's a citrus tree. That's because the cotton, uh, arsenic on the cotton ran us out of central Texas. So they loaded up the family and moved to the Rio Grande Valley, the Beverly Hillbilly version of bee beekeeping version of Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> we started in Gauze in Milam County. If you know Cameron, Milano, Hearn, that kind of area. Hearn is actually across the river in Robertson County. <coughs> Just across the Brazos River from Hearn is a little town called Gauze. Um, uh, anybody know the singer Ruthie Foster? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's going to be here in Temple in a couple of weeks. We're going to hear her. She's from Gauze. Grew up singing in the African American African Methodist Episcopal Church there in Gauze. Know her family, kept bees on their place. Um, this is one of our guys loading bees. Uh, and this is uh, um, uh, pulling honey in June of last year. Uh, this is Domingo that just retired after 40 years with us. This is our mead maker. This is Jonathan, my son. That's me. And uh, that is JP, another Jonathan. We have to go John and, and JP because they're both Jonathan. So. All right. Boy, and I cleaned up that formatting yesterday. I guess I've got an old version of, if I have an older version of PowerPoint, would that be my issue? Because I did this for Kansas, and I guess they got the older version. I looked at it again yesterday, and it wasn't right. But, well, okay, no more apologies. It's just going to be wrong, I guess, through the whole thing. <laughs> so I think what I'm saying there is that bridal honey to create opportunities. I had another word in there. Uh, this right here, let me just see what we've got. So uh, that is... Uh, okay, I don't know. I think it's, I hope it's clear in the next one. But, uh, oh, I know. Th yeah, this is, this is some cotton honey. This is a Central Texas wildflower honey. I've got some sesame in there. I'll get a better one. But what I'm trying to say is when you produce varietal honeys, you have opportunities to create, to carve out markets for yourself. That's in an HEB deli and some mooth jars. There is a little comb honey in there. But mostly that's a one pound and an eight ounce mooth. And I don't see the crates, but they stock the crates where you can stuff your own crates. And it's, now, now here's, here's, I guess this is the better one I want to show you. This is all in one season. We produce these unique varietals in five counties in Central Texas in a locale. And that doesn't, that happens very intentionally, and so that's why we're having this talk. That doesn't happen by accident. So that's Central Texas clover. We've got a mine reclamation project that, uh, that we're on, and they seeded clover in 20 years ago, and they don't put any fertilizers, any chemicals. They don't spray it for bugs or anything. They just hay it. And, uh, and we managed to make some beautiful clover honey. Some of the best clover honey, I think, made in Texas. And I, I'm not, that's not, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying we're fortunate enough that we've got a spot. And, uh, and we've made uh, one year, uh, let's see, 2014, we made uh, almost 100 drums of that on uh, about half of our beets we had on that cotton. This is pecan honey. This was a wonderful surprise for us. Uh, guys actually went out to start putting organic acids in for mites in August and Jonathan calls me from the bee yard and he says, we're not treating these today and I said, why? He said, well these empty supers we put on two weeks ago are full. So I ran out there. Uh, I've seen pecan honeydew, oak honeydew. How many of you have tasted a pecan or an oak honeydew in your beehive? Yeah, lots of you. 
And uh, some of you that have Midwest beekeeping experience may have had a, a uh, tasted uh, soybean honeydew. Uh, that's probably the honeydew that's most widely produced. I've tasted this my whole life as a kid. I can remember Dad saying, oh, come see this. And he'd hold up a frame, and it'd be white honey. But there'd be one just circle over here in the edge of the corner, or sometimes in the center, of just a real gooey, like taffy, that needs to be cooked just a little longer. It's just got a stringy, gooey consistency to it. Uh, the honeydews, that's fun. I, I may go into that a little more later, but they're not produced from nectaries. It's where the aphids uh, sting the plants. Um, actually, in California, they make an oak honeydew. Art Thomas was telling me this when we were discussing honeydews a while back because he grew up in the Central Valley. That's from the, the wasp that creates the gall on the oak trees and it actually drips off the trees. It's, this is Central Texas Yopon Holly honey, some local sesame honey. This was a seed a one-time seed deal that, a, that an organic grower that we sit on his place all the time uh, did, and uh, that was really a neat honey. I've never made it and couldn't find anybody that had uh, trying to find out if, the, if sesame made honey. We just moved 100 hives in and they made a great crop, and so it was a kind of a serendipity. And white brush is out in uh, uh, Mark's country, out uh, Lano, San Saba County. You get it all over South Texas, but we produce it in the hill country on rare occasions when it works okay so well uh, you know you've already read that but but here's the real deal if you produce varietal honey so let's let's let me just assume maybe you're producing your local wildflower honey i know some of you are doing varieties and some of you are doing these specialty honeys like this um but uh, you're doing your wildflower honey like we do on joe and sarah dorn's place sarah's it's here it's a wildflower honey that we do, and it's Gallardia and horse mint. It's a bee mix. It's a bee blend. So I can't separate that out and say, here's your Gallardia. I've had one year in Central Texas in 25 where, we, where the, for whatever reason, the horse mint didn't produce. We just got Gallardia. It's golden, buttery, uh, Indian blanket, firewheel, you, you know, with Gallardia pulchella. And uh, so we actually had an opportunity to produce honey on, on you know, areas like uh, Sarah and Joe's place is just right out here west of Belton um, in the hill country. And then we're from here east is 25 miles of black land and then we're in the sand. So in a five county area, we can go from uh, Yopon in the spring in the sand. Uh, this was made on the black land, the honeydew, as was the sesame. A little bit of hill country right here. Joe and Sarah's place still has the good wildflowers right here in the edge of the hill country. So we can straddle biomes and, and produce honey. But when you do that, you create loyalty to you. You are in a niche that no one else occupies. You know the, the uh, visual etymology of niche is that little, that little cutout in the wall where the statue sits. You're back in that cutout and nobody can occupy that space. And they come to you for that because I mean, you can't compete with me on that and I can't compete with you on your varietal honey because you didn't make it here. You made it in your county or your corner of the county and uh, we're gonna talk about that. That makes you a destination. They have to come to, I'm back to my, I shouldn't say hole in the wall, but that's where I went with niche. So they come to your hole in the wall and, and get that honey. They have to come to you and therefore <coughs> you build in a bigger margin and you make a better profit. So you can make money in honey or in anything by economies of scale or by occupying a niche and understanding that your brand is is about more margin and more profit and therefore lower volume scale so if that's if that philosophy fits you then you might cons you know consider doing more all right so i had all the p alliterations in my thing you know plans and processes and, and per chance and we're going to get all that so i'm going to try to stick with my alliterations a little bit plans <laughs> When does it bloom? So this is somebody else's nice calendar. I don't do the calendar, but if you wanted to quiz me on the 30 plants, I could tell you, you know, like I did the Yopon, you get that. So that's the deal is when's normal first bloom? And then, but, but you know, we had a warm winter. And so what does that mean for, well, we know the Yopon is going to bloom early because it didn't get reset by a cold winter. I'm praying for a cold winter. Uh, the wall, he is really sensitive in South Texas. The, uh, is it, it's an acacia most of you are familiar with, but it's a cousin to the to the honey mesquite. Uh, but that's one and cat cat's claw and and, uh, and those are acacias. Um, and you're looking at your March time frame, and but while he is real sensitive, it needs a good cold winter to reset it. <coughs> while he starts blooming, full bloom before about the 20th or 25th of March, just not going to have the big concentrated crop. It blooms through April. Um, so. 
and you know the rain, the old timers in the valley used to say in the South Texas, in the littoral, the brush country, you say, the fall hurricane, you make well here in the spring. You know, and of course they could count on a cold winter then, we can't anymore. So I, now I would say fall hurricane, cold winter, you can count on a Wahia crop. We haven't had that. We haven't had that in, in years. The Wahia crop's been bad and short. And we didn't make Yopon this year for the same reason. Yopon blooms the 10th of March. Well, it's not warm enough. Bees are not flying. We need 85 and sunny. And what we got was a cold front about every four days. You know, and the bloom was half over by the time the cold fronts quit blowing in. And so the bees would get one afternoon of, you know, 80 degrees and sunshine. And we'd think, oh, we're going to turn the corner. The next cold front. Clint did what? No, you didn't. Okay. All right. So we're just SOL. Huh? Turn it off and let it cool. Okay. Is the fan on though? No. Is the fan locked? Yeah. Fan locked. Yeah, so just turn it off and let it cool, and then we'll see if it will. Okay. So. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, let me just talk, not knowing, not knowing what I have on this thing, and if it comes back on, we'll go back to it, and uh, we'll we'll jump to Q and A a lot quicker, and I'll get it all set. Uh, so you won't be at a deficit other than you miss some really nice pictures that I had of plants. Um, basically, what I was going to do is go through and run, and run through a lot of the plants that we use, but I think maybe a better way to do this would be to, just to go through some of the things that you will need to self-educate on uh, to be successful. And one of the things is understanding where plants are and, and how to get to them. So one of the things that you can do, most of you are in a local bee club, I assume. If you're not, let me encourage you to join one. There are some old beaks in there that if you ask the right questions, they will tell you what's in their what the repository of knowledge, right? Uh, and they will love doing it. And but you have to sit down and you have to get inquisitive. And, and so one of the things you can say is, what do we used to make honey on here? What are we no longer making honey crops on here? And and think about why. So uh, one of the things, uh, uh, let me talk about Mark Headley's uh, country out there in the hill country. Um, uh, so I grew up hearing all the lore on whitebrush. It is Aloysia gratissima. It's related to uh, almond verbena that some of you might have in your yard. Uh, there's another um, Aloysia mark. Anybody in here know what the other besides uh, whitebrush, bee brush? Kidneywood? Yeah, Texas kidneywood. Yeah, I think that's right. That's best use in hardy. Oh yeah, there we go. E-Y-S, -E yeah. yeah, yeah, right, right, right. It looks the same. Yeah, that bloom is so close on the Texas kidney one. Times of the yeah, year. that's right. Texas kidney would not. There is another lotion, but anyway, the yeah. one out there, the, the, it's interesting, beekeepers call it white brush. All the ranchers call it bee brush. Right, Mark? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you learn it, which is interesting, beekeepers should call it bee brush. But, uh, but if you go out in that country, they call it bee brush. It's a stick. It's a bunch of sticks that have no leaves on them. It turns green. The leaves just pop out. And then you're going to get a bud cycle. And, uh, and then you get a bloom. And uh, after it blooms, it, a lot of times if it rains during the bloom, it runs the bloom, knocks it off, it rebuds. And so you have to know we need to get a rain, and a week later we're going to get a bloom, and a week later we need a rain to get the next bud to set, right? Yep. And, exactly. and then the old timers always said it never produces if the nighttime temperature is below 70. And my, then my personal, on the other end of the spectrum, my personal experience is that when you get a high pressure system and you're at 100 and, you know, 99 to 103 degrees on daytime highs under a high pressure, so you're dry, it desiccates the bloom and you won't make a crop. So it, it's what I call a finicky plant. Another finicky plant is cotton. Now we pulled out a big ag, I told you, and we don't do this anymore, but we produce cotton 65 of our 87, 88 years. And uh, <clears throat> cotton has extra floral nectaries. Well, why does that matter? Well, it's got nectaries under the blossom at the, the sepal, it's got three, and then under each leaf, it's got uh, a nectary down here toward the tip on the central vein uh, underneath there. Because if you show up to cotton when the first bloom opens and you say, I'm on time, I got here to the cotton in time with my bees, you just missed the best 10 days of your cotton flow. 
because you make a super of honey before the first bloom opens on the extra floral nectaries. Now this is more the good old days. They changed a lot of the cotton species. A&M, thank you A&M. I say a lot of good things about A&M, but I'm not proud of them on this. They bred the nectaries out of most of the cotton varieties. So did the University of Alabama. There's plenty of guilt to go around on that. But the chemical, chemical companies wanted to breed the nectar out of it because there was a false assumption 40 years ago that attracting insects to cotton was a bad thing. So they ran their beneficials off, and we don't make nearly the cotton crops we used to make. And we used to make cotton right on into September, up to almost the first of October. We were still, I can remember making two supers of cotton honey after the first of September. Um, but anyway, cotton has a finicky thing about it if you don't know about the extra floral nectaries, but someone in your bee club knows that, or cotton farmers know that. Uh, or your, your experimental uh, efforts to produce a varietal honey will teach you that. And so, uh, just like the, you know, back to uh, the hill country uh, white brush, uh, bee brush, Aloysia. If you don't go and you don't try, you don't know. You don't learn and then you don't know. So, part of producing varietal honeys is failure. I mean, that's really part of our business, right? It's part of our lives. If we don't fail, we don't learn. If we don't have financially hard times, we never learn how to run lean and mean. So when times get good, we just blow through our money. So if you don't, you know, that, so that's just a universal principle. Well, it's the same in producing varietal honeys. You have to try and fail and try and fail. And finally, you put some things together and you succeed once and you say, what's different now? So I can't recommend enough about keeping records of what you do. So we know when it rained, I've got in my phone right here, I've got, uh, I keep every rainfall total right here. And I'm a member of a rainfall organization that monitors and you can do, um, my old man brain here, uh, the, you know what it is, the weather site. Let's do TBA, uh, it'll say it starts with TBA and it's varietal honeys. And it's right there. C Walker. Right here? Yes. Um, so, was this a warm winter? Was it the cold winter? The cotton farmers do this, and a lot of other farmers do this in the Midwest. They won't plant cotton, and is a cotton farmer in the room can tell me this? It's a certain number of therms. It's warming days, and it's a certain number of hours above a certain temperature. I forget the equation. But you can go to any co-op in West Texas or locally if you have cotton locally and go into your co-op and say, when do we start planting cotton? And they won't give you a date. They'll say, when we've had, I'm going to make something up here. It'll be wildly wrong. Until we've had 500 hours of, of X therm. They, I think that's what they call it, a certain thing. Thank you, Michael. All right. Um, <coughs> and so then you can set your calendar based on that and it's a phone call to the you know I have when I was running on the high plains or out in uh, Sweetwater area I had co-op guys and our or farmers that I had bees on and I would just call them and say what's our planting date looking like and they said well we're going to have our therms by X and then I could do you know X number of days forward and then back 10 days from the bloom and I knew when I needed to be there but if you don't if you don't get in and learn those things, you miss your crop and you're not where you want to be. Okay, that's where we were. Great. Super. So I'll run through some of this because I've said a lot of what I'm going to say. But knowing when is the normal bloom time. Now, I will say if you're going to get into calendars, make yourself a nectar calendar and make yourself a pollen calendar. And they're two different things, right? Because, for example, we have the water elm. Um, I think it's just American elm. Dad always called it water elm, but I can't. I can't find water realm in, in the books. It's it's American it's elm. American isn't it? elm. Yeah, thank you, T. Lee. I, I looked it up. But it's thank you. It's January 15th, and it is clockwork, and it is high quality protein, no nectar to speak of. It would certainly be no nectar in the brood nest. You can't shake a nectar out of it. But I know that if I come in January 15th and do a little stimulus and feed, thin syrup with some vitamins and minerals, and and uh, we do essential oils too. That queen takes off like it's April. We catch a warm day in late January, and we will. We'll be 65, 70 degrees, and sh she'll lay in January like it's April 15. So we've jumped the clock by 90 days. But I know that because of my pollen calendar. So there's things you, you know, you need to know good pollen sources and when they start, when they come in. But this is, you know, and this is somebody, I think this is actually somebody's pollen calendar, looks like to me. But I just robbed this off the web and didn't give anybody credit for it. 
so soon, right? Uh, but this is the kind of idea, I kind of, I really like a little different style of a calendar, so I'm gonna draw it out here. So if I were gonna draw a calendar, I'd have my 12 months across the top and the bottom, and then I'd start it in January, and I'd say, okay, my first nectar flow is in March, and I know where that is, and you know, what county and what areas and what ground that's on, and the Yopon should start blooming March 25th, but I'd give it a, I'd give it a dotted line back to the 10th, because I know now, after this year, it can bloom as early as the 10th. So I'd go dot, dot, dot from the 10th to the 25th, and then I'd start ramping it up, and I'd have it peak about the 1st of April, and I'd have it, you know, stay pretty plateau out there till about the 15th or the 20th, and at the 20th, I'd start, you know, dying off, and by the 1st of May, I know Yopon's over. And so now, because I've done this, I know when to be there in that area, when to move my bees into that area. I know when to have my dry supers on that are gonna hold my yopon that don't have any other honey in them. I'm a little ahead of myself. I'm a, hey, we're already off kilter, so that's okay. Um, and I know when it's gonna bloom or should bloom. And then I know when to pull that honey. And I try to pull that honey as the flow is tapering off. If I wait till the end, I've got my rusty viburnum, I've got my rattan vine on the creeks, I've got some bitter honey that are going to bloom, uh, bitter plant, you know, and I know I'm not going to get my pure yopon. And so I, I'm shooting for something that I can look you in the face when you walk in the store or, or a wholesale customer and I can say, that's 85, 90% yopon, that's as good as it gets. That, that, you know, the one year we had when it was just perfect and 90, 95% yopon and I can represent it as a true varietal. And, and so what happened this year? Well, I think I get to that, let me go on. So there's GC, that's my dad, uh, last couple of years. But this is the Yopon Bloom. Um, if you were in Becky's class, <coughs> Becky's session in here just a minute ago, she showed her one of her last slides was beautiful red berries on denuded plants in the winter trees. And that was Ilex decidua, that was Red Hall, Red Hall Holly, Possum Hall Holly, exactly, it goes by a lot of names, but it is, yop, it is deciduous yopon, and this is the evergreen, and that's vomitoria. The Spanish, when they came to Texas, found the natives brewing a tea, this is caffeine laden, and there's actually a company now uh, here in Texas, and I, it's the yop, I think it's the Yopon Tea Company, or Yopon Holly Tea Company, um, and uh, they dry these and, and do the old fashioned and make a drink out of them, but, the Spaniards named this plant Chocolate del Indio, the chocolate of the Indians. In other words, their caffeine source. It's how the, how the Indians were, was their coffee or, or chocolate. Yeah. Uh, this clover, that's crew. Uh, at, now, so this is, the, this is a wild clover, uh, not, this is a volunteer. That's what I want to say, it's a, you know. Uh, clover's an annual, but it, it, uh, it germinates one year and it blooms the following year. It's a biannual. Right? Biennial. Okay. What? Say it again? Biennial. Biennial. Thank you. Right. Uh, this is a seed crop. Um, and I no longer work, work this. I did that probably. Dad started with that family back in the 60s. They've grown clover seed every year since the early 60s. And we've had bees on them. And we quit it two years ago <coughs> because of the cotton issues in the neighborhood. It's a farmed area. But we, we certainly made a crop that year. That's a pallet of honey. That's a pallet of honey. That's a pallet of honey. Um, and, and you know, and you see how often we're stacking a pallet of honey off of this many hives. Yes, ma'am. So, do you have to put it like in the middle of two acres or two miles worth or something because the bees go that far? Great or? question. How close do we get? And, and, and what's our stocking rate? If we were having to talk about cattle, we'd be talking stocking rate. How many, how many cows to the acre, you know, or if it's really good stuff, how many I mean, really poor stuff, how many acres to the cow in West Texas they talk about? Mm -hmm. um, we get is we don't you don't have to be this close to the clover you know the stocking rate on clover on a 40 acre patch of seed clover you can't put enough bees on it a, a thousand hives i'm not exaggerating it's the same with chinese well it, the old days the chinese towel on the coast you know now it's different down there their their crops have been cut in half on the coast but i can remember going down the chinese tallow anybody know glenn mace uh chris moore bought his operation chris moore in pasadena was where glenn was and one year we droughted out on the black land. We moved our bees to the coast and on some of Glenn's locations. And I, I took him in on a location. I think Chris probably still has this location. It's a big, long dredge, five to two and a half miles long. And Glenn said, yeah, bring, bring 400 hives down and we'll put them. I've got three locations. 
So we get it, we open the, unlock the gate, it's a water authority thing, uh, coastal water authority, and we start driving in and I see 50 of Glen's hives and we drive past a little more down the bayou, <coughs> the dredge channel, and there's another 50 of Glen's hives and then we get to the next clearing just 100 yards down on the, down the bayou and he says, okay, we're gonna put 50 here. And I said, man, I just saw 100 hives, Glen. He said, Clint, you don't know anything about tallow. Unload them. We unloaded them. We drive down past two more of his sets. We put another 50 in. We, we had 200 hives. He had 400 hives in a two and a half mile stretch, 100 yards apart, 50, 50, 50. And we both made a bumper crop, 150 pounds of tallow. So, so stocking rate is about the plant. And with a lot of plants that we don't even like to be three miles from ourselves. We like to give a three mile space. But then there's some things like this clover. If, if I'm within a half mile or a mile of that clover, that's great. We'll even be a, a two miles from it. But we want to be two miles from ourselves. That's kind of normal stocking rate. Um, but you again, you learn that from pasturing and foraging. But generally, as close as you can get. We know now, we used to say two mile radius, that's 10,000 acres that bees would forage, and we know now that that number is closer to three and a half miles. That's what a, a recent Penn State study told us. So, Jordan, just for my sake, we're finish up here at what time? We finish at 11.05. 11.05, great, thank you. I know you haven't given me my first 10, and I'm watching, so. All right, let's do it. Oh, so there's your Gloria Pultella. Um, forget where that was taken. Here's, here's some really close to being straight Gallardia honey. Um, and uh, you can see it's a golden yellow, buttery, great plant, black land. It, it grows in the sand sometimes, but there's a redder version of it, and we've never been able to produce it in the sand. And, and some plants are ground specific. Cotton, for example, don't even bother moving bees to cotton on sandy ground. They'll still grow it on irrigated sandy ground and they can produce a cotton crop, but you won't make any honey there. I learned that the hard way. Dad said, I don't think I'd put bees in that location, son. And I did, and he was right. And, you know. Monarda, these are your horse mints. This is an interesting plant. Once you find a plant, sometimes you'll find a replicate or a similar plant in other grounds. This is sandy land horse mint. If you can see that leaf, it's a sharp, uh, longer, sharper leaf. This is black land. And this is what it looks out like on Sarah's place, this beautiful purple on the, on the limestone soils. Uh, these are very similar plants. And, and, but, but when this hits on the black land, uh, you, you can't see this, but right there on the thorax, can you see it? It's white, it's, it's actually a white stripe down the center of the thorax. That's because as she climbs up in that plant, the stamens are hanging over and the bee climbs up under the stamens and the stamens just wipe right on their back. So, she, you know, it's a beautiful transfer me mechanism system that the plant has. And so the bees get it there and they go in the next plant and transfer the pollen. And then, then of course, you know, you see them wiping their back and, and their legs and storing it in the pollen baskets. Okay, here's the process real quickly. Be there early, you know, be there early. Where is there? Where is early? Uh, what is early? That's you know, that's the, that's the tough questions of figuring out, you know, what your, what your source is. You come in with dry supers. I say, duh, because, yeah, that's, a, you, you know, of course you would know that. But then, you know, you really do want, if you're going to put a margin in it and you're going to say it's this, you want to be, you want to know and you want to do the best you can to rule out any other honeys that you've got in there. And so, you know, just know that you're, you've stripped it, and we call it stripping them down, got all the honey off of them. And uh, before we move them, move them in, put the dry supers on, and we're ready for the flow. You're always assessing the quality of the crop. We didn't need to wait till we extracted our Yopon, Yopon crop this year to know it wasn't Yopon. Because we were tasting it as it was going along, and we knew the bees weren't flying, and we... And so we actually left the supers on longer. I'll show you in a little bit here what we did with that. Uh, because we're gonna, you're gonna make lemons out of, we're gonna make lemonade out of lemons. Know when to fold them. Uh, that's always the hard thing for me out in your country, Mark. I was out there this year, you know, folded them up and came home, didn't make any white brush honey. Uh, I saw some of those out there. Say again? I think you saw some of those. You saw, you, you drove by some of those. <laughs> on the way to my yards. Yes, right. That was a too close 10 minutes. Was I too close? No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later then. 
I heard the mmm. <laughs> no. Uh, harvest quickly. That's We talked about that earlier. Segregate your honey into lots. Do a good job of marking your honey. If you make two buckets of that or 10 drums of that or 50 drums of that, get a lot number, have it in your book, know where it is, keep it where you can access it because you don't know when a customer is going to really like that. In fact, the brew industry right now, if you've, got, if you've got beer makers and brewers and things like that around, they're looking for special varietal honeys. Your mead makers that entered the mead contest here, that's going to grow in the next few years. They're looking for a unique varietal. If you produce it, you've got one five gallon bucket or a couple of gallon jugs of it, and you know it's true to type, then you keep that honey segregated and somebody may pay you a premium for that. And there's, there's outlets and that just be creative in your marketing and think about who's out there. And then move your bees on to the next flow, if, if there is a next flow, you know. All right, what's your marketing approach? It doesn't have to be, so you, you came in here to hear about varietal honey production, and that's what I'm talking about, you know, floral source, true varietal honey. But why? Why not? Why not your locale? This is your local wildfire honey. You know that's what your customer wants. That's the number one selling honey in Texas is your local wildfire honey, my local wildfire honey. So it's Coastal Bend honey, it's Zapata County honey, it's East Zapata County honey, it's South, you know, whatever. It's uh, the name of that hill right over there that you produced it around and all the locals know about. And so this is what we did with our Yopon crop this year. We're tasting it as it goes along, and it's, it's April the 1st, and boy, you can tell there's some Yopon in there, but that's, I'm not going to sell this to my Yopon customer, because they've been buying that from me for 15 years. They know they want Yopon honey. And I'm not going to tell them that's Yopon honey. I'm going to tell them there's some Yopon in there. So this is our 2017, I think the lid says spring 2017, Six Mile Creek honey. Well, everybody in Milan and Burleson County knows Six Mile Creek. It divides the counties, runs down into the Brazos. And so when I say Six Mile Creek, all of my Yopon, I'm doing something that I know my Yopon customers know. That's in their mental lexicon. And, uh, and if they don't, we'll educate them on it. If they come in and say, where's my Yopon honey? Well, we didn't make it this year. Here's what we made. About half Yopon and we tell them what else is in it. I'm going to show you a little placard next here that, that we did to, 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 to educate our customer on that. Think wine, think cheese. They've done a great job educating their customers. Nobody ever goes to the store for cheese. You know what cheese you're going to the store for. You know what wine you like to drink, what beer you drink. You have a reason, you have a personal preference. That's what we have the opportunity to do is educate the public. And, we, and that's why I hope everybody does this. Because when you educate someone and they run by my place, they go, oh, my local <coughs> person has this honey. Man, I may be calling you saying, hey, can I get some of that? That's, that's you know. So that's how, we, that's how we do it. You heard of zip code honey? Yeah? Nobody? That's a big deal in the urban areas. People have rooftops and they say this was made in the 76502. That's how they label it, you know, right here on the link, 76502. I've seen one, this is a great thing. I saw some at a farmer's market. It just had a hang tag on it with, you know, tied around with a piece of raffia or, or, or twine. And it was a, it was a blank uh, craft paper card. And it just had a latitude and longitude. longitude. <laughs> GPS honey, there you go. And yeah, is that not creative? So you don't have to say, this, oh, this is Yopon. No, you can say this is Six Mile Creek. I got a place name in there. You can put a zip code on it. You can do Latin Lawn Court. You can do what you want to do because it's your unique identifier. That's why I'm trying to get us to see. So I have a friend in, in, uh, in Kansas. He keeps brings some bees down and sits on one of my locations in the winter. He does a Queen Select. What does he mean by Queen Select? He educates his customer on what he means by Queen Select. He, this is his, I'm going to call it a shtick. I don't think he'd mind me calling it. He, at the end of the season, if his bees are too heavy, he goes into the brood nest, which has some honey from throughout the season because he's been putting dry supers on, extracting them, putting dry, moving them, putting dry supers on, extracting and moving them, making another crop up here. He goes into the brood nest at the end of the season, pulls some, some, some honey frames off the side, extracts that special in small batches and call it Queen Select because it stayed in the brood box with the queen all year long. So what is, what's he done? He let the bees blend a year-long sample of the honey he made all over five minutes. Thank you, Jordan. And he calls it Queen Select. And he gets about $5 a pound more for it. 
Okay, Stig. I don't know what you call it, Stig or Genius, right? Uh, estate, estate, you make it on your farm. I mean, that's what the wineries do. That's all an estate wine is. We grew the grapes, we crushed them, we made the wine, and we sold it to you right here on the farm. Nothing ever left the farm, nothing came onto the farm. We made it all right here. So you make this on your farm, call it estate honey. Right? Why not? Uh, you didn't you didn't carry the bees off somewhere. Chronology, time of the year, that's what we were doing with this 2017 and on the, the, the little sticker on the top of the lid says spring, spring 2017, Six Mile Creek. Uh, each identifier that you put on it secures your, your niche, hole in the wall, meant positively, and it reduces your competition. So this is what we do in the store. On each one of our varietals, we will tell the customer what it is. So if we can't get to every customer, or they don't want to talk to us, they just want to shop, you know, no thank you, I'll go find my stuff. Now they know this year it's not Yopon, it's Six Mile Creek Honey, and we tell them it's got the Yopon in it and, and where it's from and in case they didn't know and a little bit of history. And so you try to write that, you know, back label to a wine bottle kind of thing and, and let them stand there and read it, and that's your education piece. Honeydew Honeys I've talked about. Um, that's, um, uh, this is pecan on the right. I'm not sure if that's pecan on the left. I don't think it is. Um... You're going, let me just let me just say this. If you're not doing a varietal honey and you want to try one, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a secret. You can make a varietal honey next summer, get your bees somewhere if you're in the eastern half of Texas, if you're from I-35 East, and, and some other places, not just that, but you know, broadly speaking. There is a new aphid that's been around uh, not new, it's been around <laughs> millennia. Okay. Uh, new, to, uh, new to our area and, and, and proliferating, the uh, sugarcane aphid. Well, all the sorghum, the maize that's grown in Texas, they're all sorghums, okay? They're all grasses. And uh, the sorghum that you make cane out of in Tennessee, the, the sh ribbon cane, sugar cane that they make uh, sh white sugar and, and, and uh, cane syrup out of in Louisiana. And our maize are I don't know, you could call them sisters or cousins, but they're all in the same genus. And they're sorghums. And the sugarcane aphid will, will uh, chew on the leaf and suck the foam out of it. And aphids have very, very rudimentary digestive systems that basically, one entomologist said it's kind of like a screen or a sieve. And they kind of get a little bit as it comes by. 85% of what an aphid takes in, an aphid puts out. Okay? And it's on the leaf, and that is. Call it what you want. That's honeydew. Okay, honeydew. Yeah, there you go. Is that you, Michael? Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. And and the bees and every it drips on your car and you don't park under pecan tree in July and August and Texas. We all know that and that's why. And so, but I will tell you that aphid is proliferating and and here's the caveat: if you don't get sprayed because they're spraying to kill the aphid. A lot of the managed crops, they've already got the systemics in the in the seed treatment and they've done a foliar application before it blooms and so the stuff's already you know locked and loaded and the aphids are going to bite it and die. But but right now we are seeing uh, crops of sorghum honeydew honey all over the state that we haven't seen before. And but it'll be some trial and error and you'll make some mistakes. But if you've got 50 hives and you want to try this. Put four or five over here, and put four or five over here, and put four or five over here, and you'll run into a honeydew in some certain situations. Okay, there's a fun one. I know someone. I know someone, and she's here in the room. I know one person ever in my lifetime that made, made money off this crop. That knows how to make money. That, and that's why I put it on here. I didn't know you were going to be in the room, T. You knew I was. I didn't know you'd be in the room. I'm so glad you're here because I was going to use her as an object lesson, and I wasn't going to call it shtick. <laughs> but it's genius, and she has customers that look forward to her hot honey. This is the U Forbes are uh, in the uh, milkweed family. And Jordan, I know I'm running on gasping on gas here. Okay. Uh, and there, that's a high alkaline, the milky white sap, right, that you get, and it's sticky. Uh, that's a very high alkaline, uh, high pH. And um, think bleach. And it'll burn, some of them will burn you. And this honey is almost flavorless. 
and it's water white, beautiful honey, and I taste it and I go, I don't taste anything, and you don't, and then you go about your business and you take this and you breathe across your throat and it burns like heck, right? <laughs> okay, that's the alkalins that are transferred. I forget the specific alkaline but she makes money out of it. And that, that's a great example of, you got something special, you can sell it. Market it right, like T. Lee's done for years. I think that's Texas kidney wood. This is white, <coughs> that may be that white brush bark. No, I think that's kidney. I think this is kidney wood. I'd probably put a bad picture in here. But this is white brush right here. And that's, we already talked white brush. I'm gonna run through it. Per chance, network with your old bees. Study your biomes, know your, your landforms. Put your bees out, experimental. Ride the roads, be curious. If, you, if this doesn't interest you, then don't do it. But you really, you know how you are. If you're passionate about what that thing you're passionate about in your life, if it's fun and you're passionate about it, you will have pure pleasure. That's my final P, alliteration, and I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.